bringing back the magic of the environment. Um, this one's going to be about um, fighting in the skies, about um, the elf, wild elven kingdom that's um, in the giant trees where there's like the tree branches are so wide that they use them as walkways and there's rope bridges between each of them. It's the the fight on the uh, cliff side. You have the, the classic image of the D&D &D band going hundreds of feet, maybe thousands of feet into the air up this switchback cliffside, and there's only enough room, it's only wide enough to allow passage by uh, maybe horseback or even walking along. And and there's all you can see is a cliff face above you, and then there's walkway, and there's nothing but a sheer drop below. Um, it's fighting on floating islands or um, fighting on airships, fighting, fighting in the sky. So um, I'm going to break down not aerial combat, but but those characters that have to be on solid ground that are fighting in the air, right? I'm not including like flying spells, wings of flying, uh, mounted combat, anything like that. But you, you have yourself, I think, three three things going on. One is uh, limited mobility, right? So you're you're in the um, you know they've got you know dozens of these giant trees, the wild elves the kingdom. And they have dozens of these trees and they're, you know, the trees are hundreds of feet tall. There, there's um, rooms inside of them. There are walkways. They can walk back and forth. You know, it's like the Ewok trees, right? And um, there's havens up there. Well, you have limited mobility. So as a game master, you, you're going to have to uh, alert, foreshadow your players, alert your players that, you know, you, you won't be able to dodge back and forth like you think you can on these narrow branches. And um, as would have it in many uh, of, um, if we take Lord of the Rings, for example, for some reason, no matter how high you are in the air, there's no hand railings, right? But yeah, you got your rope bridge, you got some railings here and there. So you have the idea that you have limited mobility. So even in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, you're, you're talking, it could be pretty easy to slip off one side or the other. Even from ranged combat, dodging, trying to dodge arrows and javelins and rocks thrown at you and spells being cast at you is pretty difficult. So you may have to establish some kind of a, you know, using 5th edition, hey, you just do a blanket disadvantage to dodge. You can get rid of dodge bonuses or limit the dodge bonuses or something like that. Um, so you have limited, limited mobility. Um, the second thing, of course, is falling. Right, so you got falling damage. Um, I'm one to resist, like save versus death. Right, so you know, player character misses a roll, they fall off the ledge, they fall 200 feet to their death. Right, I, I'm I'm against that kind of thing. So the third thing you have is is resisting the two. Okay, so you have limited mobility, you have falling to your death, and how do you resist the two? Um, there's a couple ways to do it. Pathfinder has a system where you can, you know, you make a combat, um, you have combat maneuvers and you can push somebody five feet or ten feet or something, which would be good for player characters. It's basically like, you know, you, you got your dwarven barbarian and he can just like bowl himself into a couple of orcs and just push him off the edge of a, um, edge of a, a tree branch and have him fall to their doom. But unfortunately, the same thing can happen to the player characters. So... Uh, one way would, to do it would be a um, is a grasping save, like whether it's dex or strength or something like that, or hell, even charisma. If you want to use charisma as a as a quote unquote luck save, you can use. Um, I like to do them in sets of three. So combat's your f number one. Number two is your saving throw to to keep from falling. Right. So you can hold use your strength roll to hold onto the rope bridge and you hang by one hand. Use your deck save to, you know, to, to uh, tumble out the way so you can grab onto something before you fall to your doom. Something like that. And then you, like me, I like to rely on my D4s or D6s. You can roll to see how far they fall or like how many feet, like 10 to 40 feet. Or you can even do a thing where um, you fall but you land on another ledge or you jink your shoulder as you fall down to another rope bridge and you take 1d4 points of damage something like that right or um you you know 
know, you, you roll to save, you, you miss your roll to save, you jink your shoulder, you roll a d4, okay, you're at minus three for three turns, unless someone can heal your shoulder and you get it back and get it dislo you know, push your dislocated shoulder back to where it goes or something like that. Um, you have all kinds of ways. The, the other thing about um, being at such high uh, levels, of course, is that once player characters are kicked off a ledge or even creatures are kicked off of ledges, they are no longer in the combat, right? So you will have a thing where you got your Dwarven Barbarian who gets um, attacked by, you know, pterodactyl uh, mounted, you know, orcs that are coming in to fight the wild elf you know, elves in the trees or something, and he gets hit in the shoulder with a javelin, and he falls 60 feet down. Even if he survives, now he's got to make his way 60 feet back up the switchback or the spiral staircase to get back up into the combat or something. Um, lastly, well, how do you, in games that don't have combat maneuvers, like how do you adjudicate who falls and who doesn't? Um, one simple way would be to roll a saving throw against the damage, right? So if you take seven points of damage, You've got to make like a constitution roll um, against the seven to see if you remain standing. That might be too simple because then, you know, then you're talking, well, the only way they'll ever fall is if they take like 12 to 15 to 20 points of damage. Will it ever be a threat? You could add five to it, right? So um, you've got to make a saving throw plus five. So if you take 10 points of damage, you got to roll against a difficulty of 15 or you probably you got to make a roll to, to hold on. Um, you could add 10 to it, especially if it's a narrow ledge, right? So if they take two points of damage, they've got to roll against a difficulty of 12. That's just using D&D &D as an example. D&D, &D, I guess, third plus additions or whatever. Um, um, but using height um, as a uh, environment in combat maneuvers, especially if the player characters are like, Say they're on that cliffside and there's hill giants or stone giants throwing rocks at them down the side of the cliff, and they've got to dodge side to side and not fall off of it. That that would be pretty interesting to um to accommodate that. And of course, if you've got a wizard who's got flight and tensors floating disc, it kind of defeats the purpose. But my point being is that you can use the environment to add more difficulty. If they're all if you've got stone giants fighting on a flat level plane against the player characters it's just like eh, whatever but if they're on the cliff side that's going to be pretty dangerous i would refrain from using a lots of height in a game unless the game specifically involves like airships and fighting from airship to airship and balloons and you know gliders and stuff like that um unless that's part of your setting uh, simply because the credibility it, it can break the immersion if player characters just don't fall to their deaths. I mean, some, you know, you start getting to a point where, like, now your sixth player character just happens to fall into, like, water or something soft or whatever. It breaks the uh, immersion. So I would refrain from doing that because somebody's going to fall to their death at some point. And if the player characters are adamant about doing it, hey, you foreshadowed it, that's fine. So anyway... Um, just wanted to use height, um, aerial combat, um, fighting, maybe there's mounted combat. If you have rules for mounted combat, that's cool. You can have people, you know, making saving throws so they don't fall off of the saddles. You have airships where people are shooting at each other with, uh, everything from bow and arrows to crossbows to trebuchets to cannon at each other and, um, jumping onto, you know, an orc rider on a on a pterodactyl or a wyvern and having a player character jump in the air and tackle them or something like that. I wouldn't add too many difficulties for doing that, especially if you want to run a cinematic game. Um, but depending on how gritty you want it, if you're playing in a very gritty game, I would refrain from even having anything like that because you're going to have a lot of dead player characters and they're going to be kind of pissed off if you railroaded them to have to climb these huge heights only to find out that they're just going to die when they get up there. So anyway, um, kind of ranted a little bit on this one, but just uh, bring back the magic of the environment using the using height, using the air, using you know those those really fantastic uh, elements, 
and uh, use that as your your third character, third element um, in the game from combat to social interaction to exploration. So anyway, DBJ kind of went on long enough about this and I'm out. Thanks guys.